I would like to address in our next talk, so people know just a uh, word out there, how to discern true from false prophetic messages, end time messages, how to know which ones are true, which ones are false. There are many websites out there that are claiming to be true, and people are pushing them as if they're true. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good to be back to continue the wonderful lessons that our Lord has imparted to the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta. Last week we talked about the overturning of Roe versus Wade in the context of the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, because the two coincided. One week and one day ago today. So having spoken of the Sacred Heart last Saturday, let us now talk about the Immaculate Heart on this Saturday and its relation to the perfect, full, and complete life in the divine will. I'm going to talk about a theme that I will continue next week that has never been addressed before. And yet that stands out in the writings of the servant of God and it is of great relevance to us because there are three adjectives that Our Lady does not really expound upon but nonetheless mentions so that we in reflecting and pondering her words might expound upon them. And that is precisely what I intend to try to do today. Basically, the three adjectives Our Lady uses in day seven of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book are full, perfect, and complete. Not much attention, if any, has been given to the distinction of these three adjectives when it comes to living in the Divine Will. Living fully, living perfectly, and living completely. Now, before I get to this passage, let me remind you that there are different ways of living in the divine will. And this is highlighted in volume 11, where the Blessed Lord, our Blessed Lord, tells Louisa on June 29, 1914, My beloved daughter, the sea symbolizes my immensity, while the objects, different in size, symbolize the souls who live in my will, but with different ways of living. Some live on the surface, others below the surface, and yet others completely losing themselves in me, all varying according to how they live in my will. Some souls live in my will in an imperfect way, others in a more perfect way. And yet others reach the point of completely losing themselves in my will. Now, this is an important passage because it already distinguishes two adjectives that Mary or touches upon when addressing the three. In this passage of June 29, 1914, of volume 11, the Lord touches upon the perfect way of living and the complete way of living. Here he doesn't mention the full way of living, okay? Mary does. So let us enter into the writings of the servant of God, Louisa, to better understand this important distinction because we are all called to traverse, experience, and live these three ways, full, perfect, and complete. Now, which comes first? That's the question that we will we'll discuss today. But I won't give you the simple answer. I'd rather prefer that you make that decision by listening to the various excerpts 
that I will cite today from the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. So without any further ado, let us go to the seventh day of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the Divine World Book. Here Mary reveals to Luisa, as I took possession of the kingdom of the Divine Will, it completed its steps in me. Now, Mary here is alluding to the preceding six days when God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit took up their abode in Mary's soul through six steps, as is represented by the first six days. In this work, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, which is devoted to the month of May, and that encompasses Mary's entire life. So while in the womb of Anne, Mary's soul is bilocating to the abode of the Trinity, where the three divine persons outpour all of their qualities, attributes within Mary. So Mary adds that the divine will completed its steps in me. Now this is day seven, okay? She adds these steps symbolized the six days of creation. And in each of those days, pronouncing his fiat, God took a step, advancing from one created thing to the next. And on the sixth day, he took his last step, saying, Fiat, let us make man in our image and likeness. And on the seventh day, he rested in his works, enjoying all that he made with such magnificence. Now, my creation surpassed all the other prodigies of creation. And so the divinity with its fiat wanted to accomplish six steps in me and begin its full, entire, and perfect life in my soul. Now, in this passage of Mary, she uses the word in Italian, intero, which is entire, which is also, in this context, synonymous with complete. So we can say, and I'm going to prefer the word complete over entire, because entire is rarely used in Louise's writings. Complete is used to express God's totality, integrity, entirety, and accomplished life in Mary. So if you can read Italian and have access to the original manuscripts of Louisa, which I'm assuming has just com well, comprises maybe 1% of the listeners, because the original writings of Louisa that were made available to me, to me for my dissertation have not made, been made available to the public. Well, if you know the Italian and you have the original manuscripts, then you can find these different adjectives used throughout her writings. I'll give you some examples very quickly. Again, next week I'll develop this theme, so don't be too concerned if you don't catch everything now. God talks of his integral life in day three of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will. But in the English translations, oftentimes they don't translate the words exactly as they are in Italian. Then there's the total life, which is found in volume 24 on July 7th, 1928, which in, is mentioned in relation to Adam. Total life of the divine will in Adam. It's also found in volume 11 on November 25th, 1912. And then we find the accomplished life of the divine will in volume 24 on September 10th, 1928, in relation to Mary, who enjoyed the accomplished life. Adam enjoyed the integral life. And the entire life is found, as I just mentioned, in day seven of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book. And there's the complete life found in volume 16, May 9th, 1924. And the list goes on. But theologically speaking, and theologically articulating these adjectives, we must emphasize 
that all these adjectives don't represent different degrees of living in the divine will nor states. They're synonymous. What they simply express is a different aspect of the divine will itself. But the state and the degree are the same. So the expression integral life that is found in day three of the Blessed Virgin Mary book, as well as complete life, as well as entire life, as well as total life, as well as accomplished life, these are really synonyms to express different aspects of the divine will and not so much the soul, the recipient thereof, who lives to the utter completion of God. Now, when I say to the utter completion of God, I'm really speaking of this third adjective that Mary uses that Jesus doesn't really touch upon in volume 11, June 29th, 1910, when he speaks about the imperfect, the perfect, and the complete. But it's suggested there. Now, what is, let's start with the adjective, the full life in the divine will. Remember, on day seven, Mary says she began in the womb of Anne after God completed his six steps. On day seven, she began to live the full, perfect, and entire or complete life of the divine will. Now, Let's start with the word full, because this comes first. All right. I know I said I wouldn't tell you when it happened, but I just did. Okay, I blew that question. Here Mary says to Louisa that um, on day seven, the divine will began its full, entire and perfect life in her soul. Now she doesn't, when she mentions this, right, to Louisa, Louisa's writing, not Mary. This is important because sometimes Louisa, when she would write things, would write them in the incorrect order, whether it was the day and the month of the year or the syntax of her Italian grammar. She would sometimes not write in the proper sequence. And this is where it is important for theologians to review her writings to ensure that they are translated effectively and in the right sequence and order. So when Mary expresses to Louisa that she began to live the full, entire or complete, and perfect life of the divine will, we must not assume that it happens in that order, that full comes first, complete comes second, perfect comes last. Studying theologically, I won't say it to you which order they actually come in, but let me allow you to try to surmise. In volume 19, April 16th, 1926, Mary touches upon the full life in the divine will also. One stating, well, here Jesus is the one who's revealing this to Louisa. You must be our echo, Louisa, and the echo of my heavenly mother, because she alone lived perfectly and fully in the supreme will. Okay, now see the order? Perfectly comes before fully when Jesus speaks. But in day seven, full comes before perfect. So which one's right? Again, Louisa did not always write in the perfect sequence in which it was revealed to her because when God oftentimes and Mary revealed themselves to Louisa, they, she didn't sit there with a pen in her hand and ask God to wait till she finished her sentence. That's not how revelations happen. God would reveal himself to her in several ways. Number one, and most principally, by way of substantial locution. What's that? It's an interior voice that can impress itself upon the soul in one of two ways. Either by a light of knowledge without words, but nonetheless the soul understands a whole life of knowledge in that one substantial locution, 
but it is up to the soul to put this knowledge that's infused through locution into human words. Take, for example, um, looking at a person, looking at a painting that contains various events in the lives of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Just go to the Vatican Museum, the Sistine Chapel, look at the ceiling. There are no words, but there are images containing the whole salvation history event. Consider that similar to a substantial locution. God floods the soul with his knowledge without any word spoken. Now it's up to the soul to write down exactly what it understands from that light of knowledge. Oftentimes, this is the way Jesus and Mary reveal themselves to Louisa. Other times, they used words, such as when Mary stood at the foot of Louisa's bed and would dictate to her this entire work of the Blessed Virgin Mary book in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. But even when Mary spoke in these occasions, Louisa did not sit there with a pen in her hand writing everything Mary wrote, said. So a day, two, sometimes a week, sometimes even a month would pass by before Louisa wrote down what Mary said. Hence, the inconsistency of the sequence or the order of her words, unintentionally written that way. For another example where Louisa often made grammatical mistakes is when she used the word learn and teach. She would often confound the two. In Italian, imparare is to learn. Insegnare is to teach. And sometimes Louisa would say, God learned me instead of God taught me. And vice versa. I taught instead of I learned. That was another one of her imperfections. Remember, Louisa was not an author. She was not a theologian. She was a simple, barely educated, but wholly Italian woman that never left her hometown. And God used that littleness, that lowliness, so that his doctrine would not be influenced by anyone else but him. So which comes first? In the Blessed Virgin Mary book, Our Lady says that she began her full, entire, and perfect life in the divine will. But in volume 19, April 16th, 1926, God says that Mary lived the perfect and full life in his supreme will, putting perfect before fully, or as Mary puts fully before perfect. Well, we'll find the answer to that as we continue to analyze these writings. Volume 15, May 23rd, 1923. Jesus reveals, my daughter, in order to take full possession of my will, you must centralize within yourself every state of every man's soul. And as you proceed from one state of soul to the next, you will attain this possession. Do you think that living in our will is something trivial or just another path to holiness, including even the holiest paths? Ah, oh, no, no, living in our will is everything. In it, one is called to embrace everything, and should something escape the soul, it cannot say that it lives in the fullness of our will. So be attentive and always continue to follow your flight in my eternal will. So here we have another understanding of what fullness means, living fully, the first adjective that Mary uses on day seven. Here it means not letting anything escape the soul. Already we're beginning to understand the meaning of full just by that one passage. Here's another passage from August 5th, 1923, volume 16. To actualize, Jesus reveals, the work of redemption, I had to open to my humanity the doors of the supreme will that the first man had closed. And in giving my humanity the liberty to freely operate in the eternal mode, I let it accomplish the redemption within the very bosom of my supreme will. From that time on, no one else has entered my divine will. 
so as to be able to operate within it as its owner, as its own possession, and with full freedom. To enter into it and enjoy its complete fullness. Okay, that's another passage articulating the meaning of the fullness of living in the divine will. In, in this case, it relates to Christ. Now, he's talking about no one entering it into this gift before Louisa did, you see. Because after Louisa did, others could. Again, another expounding upon the adjective of fullness is found in volume 19 on May 10th, 1926. Jesus again reveals, my daughter, how beautiful is the prayer, the love, and the work of the creature in my will. Its acts are completely filled with the divine fullness. Now here, Jesus associates fullness with the soul's act. Its acts are completely filled with the divine fullness. So there's a distinction between the acts of the soul accomplished in God's will and the divine fullness that it engenders. So the divine fullness is not the act, it's the result of the act. He adds, this fullness embraces everything and everyone. What does that mean? Transtemporality. Okay, so this fullness is associated with the fruit of one's divine acts and the divine will and with embracing everything and everyone transtemporally trilocating itself into the past, present, and future. He adds, it penetrates the very heavens and fills everyone. So fullness now requires another meaning, another quality, without contradicting the other. It's the fruit of one's divine acts, it is transtemporal, and it is vicarious. It fills everyone. It fills the angels, the saints, the Holy Queen, but this is not all. It pours itself mightily into the womb of the Eternal One. The divine will, bilocated in the soul, kisses, loves, and adores all things. So here we have the fullness associated with the creature's acts and its effects of transtemporality and a vicarious increase of glory in all things. In volume 26, May 25th, 1929, Jesus reveals all generations hung upon the first acts accomplished by Adam in the fullness of the divine will. For having been accomplished in my will, they were acts full of life that had the capacity to establish the origin and the life of the acts of all creatures. In this case, again, fullness, the adjective of fullness, represents the fruit of one's divine acts in the divine will. He says these acts are full of life. So life is the consequence of divine acts. And the more acts the souls perform, the more fullness this life attains. But fullness of what? He has not yet revealed that. He says they're full of life. These acts are full of life. But what does life exactly mean here? What kind of life? Well, we begin to find the answer when we continue to explore. For example, in volume 16, September 21st, 1923. Jesus again reveals, be attentive, keep your gaze always fixed on my will, and you will find yourself with the fullness of the grace of living in my will. So now we begin to understand what this full life is, that the acts performed in the divine will engender. First, it's the fullness of the grace of God, the fullness of the grace of living in his will, which Mary possessed, which Jesus had by nature, Mary by grace. In volume 23, December 1st, 1927, Jesus reveals, 
The Holy Queen received everything from my will. The fullness of grace, the fullness of sanctity, the fullness of sovereignty over everything, and even the fruition that gives life to her son. My will communicated to her everything and denied her nothing. Now, this is a lot to take in. Mary had the fullness of grace, the fullness of sanctity, and the fullness of sovereignty over everything. Again, these are the fruits of her divine acts, not the other way around. Certainly grace preceded these acts, but the fullness of grace was the fruit of the acts. Grace preceded the acts, but grace grew by virtue of the acts to attain its fullness. In volume 28, November 27, 1927, we come across fullness in relation to God's blessings and the seed of divine fruition. In speaking of his blessed mother, our Lord relates, the Holy Queen was able to generate the eternal word without anyone's aid. Now, we have to always place God's words in the proper context. Remember, we don't read them literally all the time, because if we did, we would distort the meaning of Louisa's text, just like with Scripture. Imagine if you took literally Jesus' words that the Father and I are one. We know that's not true, taken literally. They're two distinct persons. They're not one person but they're one in nature. So we have to qualify the meaning of the words. Same thing here. Jesus says, Mary was able to generate the eternal word without anyone's aid. Well, that's not exactly true. Without the Holy Spirit, she could not conceive the word. So the Holy Spirit was essential to generating the word. What the Lord here means is that without any human's aid. Okay? And he continues by not giving life to her human will, she gave life to the divine will alone. And in this way, she acquired the fullness of the seed of divine fruition and was able to generate him whom heaven and earth could not contain. And not only could she generate him within herself, within her maternal womb, but she could also generate him within all souls. She generated everyone in the divine fiat that can do anything and that encloses everything. The Holy Queen had conquered first within herself, the, her creator, and the fullness of all the blessings that she had implored for others. So here we have fullness in association with the blessings she implored for others. She conquered first within herself a creator and the fullness of all the blessings that she had employed for others. So what does this mean? Suppose you pray for an intention and you don't obtain the results you seek, but you persist and you perfect your virtues and you live more intimately with God's divine will. And this intimacy and union with God's will hastens that which you seek, the results of your prayer. Whereas without that union and intimacy, the results that you seek would not come as expeditiously. Well, this is what the Lord is referring to here when saying that she conquered the fullness of all the blessings that she implored for others. Mary implored this and that for this soul and that soul. But when she had conquered the fullness of all the blessings, she obtained these. She obtained what she implored for others. What is conquering the fullness of all blessings? If not, being one with the divine will. Being fully united with God in intellect, memory, and will. Heart, breath, and blood, or whole body and soul. Because Mary was always united with God from the moment of her conception and never ceased to be in that intimate union with his will, she conquered the fullness of all the blessings she implored. And the same applies to us. 
And we also find in association with the fullness, the seed of divine fruition that she acquired. Again, by her intimacy, loyalty, adhesion to the divine will with unflinching fortitude. October 10th, 1927, volume 23, Jesus reveals. My daughter, the divine will is multiplied in the soul's acts, but none of its acts are dispersed. The unity that my divine will possesses and its incessant act maintain the unity of its innumerable acts as if they were one act alone. My will preserves in the soul's acts the incessant act that always, always and without ever ceasing operates. And a few sentences down he adds, I remain conceived in the acts of my divine will, in those of my divine mother, and in your acts accomplished in my will. I tell you that I was conceived continuously in the acts of those who will possess the kingdom of my will, because one who possesses it receives the complete fullness of the blessings of my life. Indeed, such a soul with its acts accomplished in my will concurs in my conception and in carrying out my entire life. Therefore, it is only right that the soul should receive all the blessings my will contains. Here the Lord associates the complete fullness of the blessings poured out by God with his life. What life? His real life. The same presence of God in the Eucharist is present now in the soul, known as his real life. In volume 14, March 24th, 1922, Jesus associates the adjective fullness with the work of creation. He tells Louisa, there is nothing that I will not centralize in you, even the multiplication of my own life. I will work new prodigies of grace, never before accomplished. And I will find in you, within my own will, the full completion of the work of creation along with the complete realization of my rightful claims upon creation and everything I desire. Just like Mary said that the six steps in her soul while she was in the womb of Anne represent the six days of creation, so here in volume 14, March 24th, 1922, Jesus says something along the same lines in relation to Louisa when stating that. I will find in you, Louisa, the full completion of the work of creation. In volume 11, March 23rd, 1910, Jesus reveals, while in the sacraments there is part of my grace, in my will, there is its complete fullness. In baptism, the stain of original sin is removed, but the passions and weakness remain. In my will, since the soul gives death to its own will, it also gives death to the passions, to weakness, and to all that which is human. And it lives on the virtues of fortitude and of all the divine qualities. So here the Lord associates fullness, the adjective fullness, with the fullness of grace, which the sacraments only give part of. The sacraments, there is part of his grace, but in his will there is the complete fullness of grace. And the list goes on. He talks about the full image of God in volume 19 on July 29th, 1926 of the soul's full dominion with God over creation in volume 16, March 22nd, 1924, and so on. So instead of going through it all 36 volumes, which would take about 
two months nonstop, just on that one adjective. Let me summarize the fullness here. When Mary speaks on day seven of living the full, perfect, and entire or complete life of the divine will, fullness here represents principally the grace of God. Mary possessed the fullness of grace, as the angel Gabriel said to her at the uh, Annunciation event. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Now, full of grace means that her soul is complete with all that which is necessary to perform her divine acts in perfect union with the divine will. What does that mean? Her intellect, her memory, her will, her heart, her breath, and her blood are in perfect attentiveness and receptivity for God to draw these faculties up into him through a work of bilocation. God absorbs Mary's soul who lets it be bilocated by the power of God. Mary doesn't bilocate by her own power. No human creature has that propensity without the grace of God. So God gives her the fullness of grace in order to unite her perfectly with him, in order for him to perform his divine one eternal act in her succession of acts so that she lives the complete life of the divine will on earth as in heaven. Now this implies that Mary has filled the voids in her soul because if so much as one void in the soul is not filled with a divine act that is transtemporal, because it impacts all things of all time, then the soul cannot enjoy this complete fullness in the divine will. Now, putting two adjectives together, complete and full, but so did Jesus in that previous passage I mentioned. If you don't remember what that was, it again comes from, let's see here. It was the third to last citation I shared with you. It's from March 23rd, 1910, volume 9. Jesus reveals, while in the sacraments there is part of my grace, in my will there is its complete fullness. Now, I just touched upon full. I have not yet touched upon the adjective perfect nor complete. And I will continue next week and the following week to address these three adjectives because they represent three stages of living in God's will that are not disassociated from each other. They're all united, but one disposes for the other. So full precedes perfect, which precedes complete. Full implies principally the grace of God. Without the grace of God, there can be no perfection and no completion. So full necessarily comes first. Certainly, as I mentioned before, the grace of God precedes the fullness of grace. We attain the fullness of grace through a series of our graces being outpoured within the soul. And Mary attained that fullness. But that fullness enables the soul to attain perfection in its union with God. That is, its intellect, memory, will, and the three principal faculties of the body, the heart, the breath, and the blood, are now united perfectly with the divine intellect, divine memory, divine will. And the soul's affectivity, its feelings, its emotions, its moods, etc., which are human, are assimilated with God. Some of you may have experienced this when reading the Hours of the Passion. If you really read the Hours of the Passion with empathy, as God wants you to, that is with compassion, 
You know, Luisa uses the word commiserare in Italian to emphasize this empathy, where the soul's emotions, its feelings, its affections are impacted by that which it meditates upon. Then you know exactly what it means to be in perfect union with God, whereby it influences your own emotions. It may not always happen because grace does not depend upon emotion. It transcends emotion. And this is something that I think not enough attention is given to. Oftentimes you may turn on the television and watch some of these tele-evangelicals, and that's good because the grace of God is not limited to the Catholic Church. Remember the apostles and the gospel? They tried to stop a group of people from prophesying, and Jesus said, don't stop them. He who is not against me is with me. Or what about when, you know, the Holy Spirit descended upon a group that was not part of the band of the apostles? They, John tried to stop them, and Jesus said, don't stop them. And Peter acknowledged that the Holy Spirit descended upon a group not associated with the apostles. So sometimes you may watch televangelicals, and that's good. And sometimes they may say something that's odd. Not all the time, but sometimes, like if uh, emphasizing the need to feel prosperous, feel blessed, feel loved. But in reality, you may not feel any of those things. And then you start to question whether or not you're even pleasing to God because you're not feeling prosperity, feeling love, feeling blessed. That's because grace transcends the emotions. And you know what St. John of the Cross says? The height of contemplation is interior aridity, meaning desolation, like Christ on the cross, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the last several years of her life where she said she was living in an interior aridity state, an, an aridity of the soul, a darkness, so to speak, of the intellect, the will, the memory. God elevates souls to this state where he deprives them temporarily of spiritual niceties, the consolations, the warm fuzzies, because these things don't really increase the soul's holiness. They console the soul, but that which in increases the soul's spiritual growth is the cross. Do you know that Jesus told Louisa when she complained of his absence, do not become upset. When I deprive myself of you, that is when I'm making you grow spiritually. Because your soul now has to strain itself to remain united with me without the consolations that enable the soul to relax, to dispose the soul to take a break. Now, the soul naturally cannot continually live in the soul of des state of desolation because it will eventually despair. So God intervenes, much like a roller coaster. There's the ascent, which is the cross going up to Calvary, and there's the descent. And in the descent, you don't have to pedal, do you, if you're riding a bicycle, but going up, you do. So, the perfect union of the soul with God engages its intellect, memory, and will. But it also engages its affectivity, its feelings, its moods, its emotions. And sometimes these, in, these engage the souls. Um, sacrifice, penance, mortification which are ways in which it expedites its growth. God oftentimes deprives the soul of things. So he uses the affectivity. So if we're meditating on the hours of the passion and we begin to weep with our Lord or shiver with our Lord or tremble like he did, that's a good thing. Because the Lord is now resting in us. 
Whenever we are going through desolation, the Lord is finding his rest and sleep in us, his slumber in us. Whenever we are enjoying consolation, on the other hand, the Lord is suffering in us. He's taking up our cross while we're resting. And this interplay endures from the moment we are conceived, from the moment the doctor slaps us, to the moment life slaps us and we enter the next life. And it's necessary to, for growth. So perfection has to do with the union of the will, of the divine will. Fullness has to do with the outpouring of grace. Completion has to do with the soul's acts being completely accomplished. Now, if the soul completes all of its acts, in this life, it doesn't go into purgatory in the next life. So this answers the age-old question that has been asked and has not yet, as far as I know, been given a response effectively. And the question is, what does Jesus mean when he tells Louisa that souls who live in my will will not go to purgatory when they die? Does it mean that the soul who is living in an imperfect way or a perfect way or a complete way bypasses purgatory? And if so, how can you explain a soul living imperfectly in the divine will bypassing purgatory? How can something imperfect enter heaven? So you see the dilemma of the question. So let me first read this passage to you that I just shared with you, paraphrasingly from volume 24, April 29th, 1928. Jesus reveals, if the soul who lives in my divine will should go to purgatory, the angels and the blessed would feel offended. The entire universe would rebel and they would not let it go to purgatory alone. The heavens, the sun, the wind and the sea would all follow this soul moving from their places, and offended, say to their creator. This soul is yours and ours. The life that animates all of us animates this soul. How is this soul in purgatory? The heavens would claim this soul with their love. The sun would speak up with its light, and the wind with its lamenting voice, the sea with its tumultuous waves. All would have a word to say to defend the soul who lived its life in common with them. But since one who lives in my will absolutely cannot go to purgatory, the universe will remain in its place, and my will shall have the triumph of bringing to heaven the soul who has lived in it on this exilic earth. So, Jesus does not qualify in this passage If the soul must be living imperfectly, perfectly, completely, fully in his will to bypass purgatory. So then how do we know if this passage applies to all ways of living his will or just one way or two ways? Does the soul who lives imperfectly bypass purgatory when it dies? That is, does the soul that lives in God's divine will imperfectly bypass purgatory? Or does it have to live in a perfect way or in a complete way? Jesus doesn't specify it here. So what do we do in theology? We cross-reference. So let us go to another passage. Where Jesus speaks of the soul's voids. Okay. I'm going to see if I can find this for I can give you the passage. I'll try to pull it up now. It comes from volume 4, July 16th, 1901. And then I'll talk about day 13 from the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will Book, because this also relates to volume 4, July 16th, 1901. Let me type this in and pull up this passage from her Louisa's volume. 
Jesus reveals, know that each soul throughout the entire course of its life is obliged to love me constantly, without intervals. If the soul does not love me incessantly, it leaves as many voids within it for as many minutes, hours, or days in which it has neglected to love me. No soul will be able to enter heaven if it has not filled these voids. No one, I'm sorry, and one is able to fill them only by redoubling its love for me for the rest of its life. If it does not reach the point of filling these voids on earth, it will be compelled to do so in the fires of purgatory. Now, when you are deprived of me, Louisa, the privation of your beloved redoubles love. And in this way, you succeed in filling these voids present in your soul. So here you see what I mentioned earlier about when God deprived Louisa of his presence, she was suffering from desolation like Mother Teresa of Calcutta the last years of her life, like Jesus on the cross, like Mary during those three days when he was absent from her in limbo. In these moments, God is redoubling love, therefore filling the void in your soul, making your soul perfect in union through the outpouring of the fullness of grace. So God's grace is depriving you of his presence to free double love and fill the void in your soul so that you can attain the complete union, or I should say complete life of God in your soul, which is nothing other than filling every void in your soul so that when you die, you go straight to heaven without purgatory. Remember, what's key to bypassing purgatory is filling the voids. That's key. If so much as one void is not filled, you cannot bypass purgatory. It says it right here, July 16th, 1901, Volume 4. Okay? So now we begin to understand why the soul bypasses purgatory. Because it has filled all the voids in its soul. With the aid of Christ, who gives it the cross, who gives it desolation, who gives it suffering, that redoubles love in the soul, provided the soul consents to this cross accepts it, welcomes it, embraces it. Now, I mentioned that I would touch upon day 13 before closing this talk. I'm about two minutes left. So in day 13, Mary talks about the soul redoubling love in the divine will. I'll see if I could pull it up here real fast here. Because... This is how the soul disposes itself to bypass purgatory. And here on day 13, looking for that specific mention of it redoubling its love. And it's also found on day 16. Mary here speaks of um, saying goodbye to her holy parents and experiencing the sacrifice of being deprived of them, two great saints. And with heroic strength, she accomplished the most arduous sacrifice and asks us to do the same to dispose ourselves when the crosses come to us in life, to embrace them heroically because they redouble the love of God in us. So this redoubling of love of God as found here, day 13, day 16 of the Blessed Virgin Mary book, is found also on July 16th, 1901 in volume four in relation to the soul bypassing purgatory, which gives us the, which in part answers the question to souls regardless of their way of living in God's will, bypass purgatory, regardless of their imperfect, perfect, or complete way. And I will give you with the answer next week. 
May God bless you and keep you in his most holy will in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.